Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at a 50 caliber Hungarian semi-automatic uh, anti-material rifle. This is actually mechanically a pretty unusual firearm, and it'll be interesting to take a look at. Now, historically speaking, uh, this project, this is the GM6, or Gepard M6, aka the Hughes, or Lynx, and this family of firearms began back in 1987 with a request by the Hungarian military for an anti-material rifle. And that first version was the M1, this being the M6. Uh, the M1 was chambered for the 12.7 by 108 millimeter Soviet 50 caliber cartridge, and it was actually a single shot rifle that required kind of like quasi disassembly. You'd, the grip itself was the bolt assembly, and you had to like take the thing off and reload it one round at a time. And it was accurate, and it fired the right cartridge, you know, could deliver a good armor piercing or incendiary payload with it, but it was really slow to shoot. And so development continued, and uh, what was created was the M2, which was a semi-automatic version, or really not a version, a new semi-automatic rifle, again firing a 12.7mm cartridge. Now in Hungary this would be the 12.7x108 Russian. As these guns entered commercial production, they were also manufactured in 12.7 by 99 or 50 Browning. 50 Browning is typically used in the West, 50 by 108 Soviet is typically used in the Eastern Bloc, and they're close enough in power and in overall dimension that it's not that big a deal for the gun to be able to use either one. Uh, not interchangeably, I should say, but by swapping bolt and barrel assemblies. So the M2, semi-automatic, long recoil action like this, uh, but that's not quite enough, and they decide to build the M3, which is essentially the same system but chambered for the 14.5 by 114 millimeter cartridge, which is a really huge, it's the anti-tank cartridge that was developed uh, for the PTRD and the PTRS uh, back in World War II, and that is an absolute beast of a cartridge perhaps a bit too much of a cartridge. Uh, by the late 1990s development had continued and they devolved to the M4 and the M5. Now the M4 was an improved semi-auto gun, the M5 was an improved bolt action. The M4 then continues its development and becomes the M6, which is what's commercially available today. So this is a design that has been undergoing incremental improvements and changes for a solid 20-25 years. Uh, and the result is really pretty impressive. So what makes this mechanically unusual is that it is a long recoil system, which means the bolt and the barrel both reciprocate uh, the full length of the cartridge. Uh, there are not that many uh, long recoil firearms out there. The Shosha is one, the Browning Auto 5, and the Remington Model 8 are a couple others. Those are the most common ones. Uh, it looks really cool in high speed footage, and it has a few advantages uh, mechanically. The primary one probably being that it is a very safe action, because the bolt and the barrel remained locked all the way back until, well, all the way through this much travel. So when this fires, the barrel is going to reciprocate that far, the bolt then locks in the rear, the barrel comes back to the front, when the barrel is all the way forward, then the bolt releases and a new cartridge is chambered. So you have a lot of time while this whole system is reciprocating backward for chamber pressure to drop, so that when the bolt unlocks there's very little pressure left. Uh, these guns are also distinctive for having what appears to be very weak ejection. That's because they're really they're not ejecting cases under pressure, they're just the barrel comes off the front of the case and a spring goes pop and the case just kind of falls out of the gun. So that's the main benefit. Now by making this a bullpup style of firearm, they have also made it uh, remarkably compact for a 50 caliber rifle. It's got a 29 inch barrel in it, but the whole gun is still relatively, well it's not short overall, but it's uh, compact enough to be carryable. Uh, total weight is right under 25 pounds, so it's a hefty gun, but it is something that is single man portable without too much trouble. In fact, interestingly, and I'll show you this up close in a moment as well, um, there is a latch on here so that you can actually retract the barrel and lock it in that position to make the thing even more compact for carry. Now the downside to this is you can't close the dust cover when it's locked back, but if you're going to put the thing in a case and transport it, well, that helps. That takes a solid 8 inches off the overall length. Anyway, let's go ahead and take a closer look at this. Uh, we'll pull it apart. I'll show you how it works. 
can I squeeze the whole thing in frame? Not quite, but close. Um, so like I said, this is a bullpup, so your ejection port is back here, magazine is back here. It is a single stack, five round magazine. And let's actually start right there. The magazine release button is back here, push that down and you can slide this out the back of the gun. This is, I'm actually really impressed by the magazine, and that seems like really a pretty minor thing, but magazines are really important parts of self-loading firearms. They can cause a tremendous number of problems just by themselves, and they are remarkably difficult to manufacture well, uh, to make them reliable. And a lot of 50s, it seems like virtually all the 50s that are out there, go with some flavor of double stack magazine. A lot of them basically just taking Barrett magazines, because Barrett's gone through the process long enough uh, to get a good reliable design. Well, Gepard went with a single stack magazine, and I think that makes a lot of sense. It's going to be much easier to design it properly. Uh, you can see we just have single stack there, it holds five rounds, and you've got five little viewing holes uh, to keep track of how many are currently in the magazine. And with a 50 caliber rifle, really the chances that you're going to need more than five rounds and not be able to reload the thing, to me, are fairly slim. So what they came up with here is a really quite robust magazine. Now we've got these two lugs on the front, and to load the thing, what you're going to do is slide those into these little cutouts on the back of the grip. So it drops in like that and then slides up into place and locks in. It's a very slick system, it's uh, nice and solid, it's not going anywhere, it's not coming out accidentally. It's a really well thought out, what seems like a minor element that actually has a big impact on how the gun runs. Alright, enough of that nerdery there on magazines. Uh, markings we have here on the side, it is a GM6 Lynx, serial number is HL239, and it is marked 50 caliber 12.7 millimeter. Conveniently, those markings are accurate whether it is in 50 Browning or 50 Russian. Uh, this particular one is in 50 Browning. Uh, they can be swapped between calibers just by changing the bolt and the barrel. The magazine itself is in fact long enough for a 127 by 108 cartridge. But the difference is slight enough that you don't get any feeding issues with a shorter browning cartridge. Um, the current manufacturer is a company called Cerro. Um, manufacturer went through a little bit of a change over the lifetime of this design, uh, primarily because of the, the falling apart of Hungarian communism uh, in 1989, which was shortly into the development cycle of these guns. Uh, and we have our US importer mark down there. One neat little feature back here, you've got a bipod on the front that you saw. There is also a rear monopod, sort of. It is just this, which is essentially a bolt with a really big round foot on the bottom. And you can screw that into the bottom of the grip to act as a third point of contact to get a really good, solid, stable shooting position if that's what you need. The safety is a very simple cross bolt plunger, essentially. Red means fire. You can snap that across, and it's white on the opposite side for safe, so that's the fire position. The trigger press itself is really not all that great, it's got a lot of mush and take up, and it's squishy. Um, so not the best trigger out there. Usable, not great. Now let's take a look at the action. We have a rotating bolt back here, that's your charging handle. And the way you typically operate this is you actually lift the handle up, which manually unlocks the bolt, and then you can pull the bolt back without the barrel moving. When this actually fires for real, the entire barrel reciprocates back like this. And you can see there's a ramp right here. This roller bearing is going to run up that ramp, which forces the bolt to unlock. So during the actual firing process, when the, bolt, when the barrel and bolt are in a position like this, it's still fully locked, and it remains locked all the way up until that roller bearing rolls up the ramp and gets all the way to the back. At this point, the bolt locks in position back there, and the barrel, which has its own independent recoil spring, the barrel is going to move forward. When the barrel moves all the way into place forward, it trips a lever, which releases the bolt to come forward, pick up a cartridge, if there is one in the magazine, and lock into place. 
like that. As I said, to reduce this thing's overall length for storage or transportation, you can lock the barrel in the rearward position, and that's done by this actually very simple little catch. So if I pull the barrel all the way back like this, and then just press that latch down, it's going to hold on to that little lip on the front of the muzzle device, and it holds the whole thing in this position. And as I said, the downside here is if you're doing that you can't close the dust cover because the bolt handle's in the way, and the roller bearing here would be in the way. So whether that's good or bad is depends on what you're doing. Now to release the barrel forward, all I have to do is push this button, which undoes that latch. Kachunk. And when that happens, obviously the barrel goes forward, it then unlocks the bolt, the bolt comes forward, and if you have a loaded magazine in the rifle, it will chamber around and be ready to fire, depending on where you have the, the firing safety. A couple more elements to take a look at here. The bipod folds up very neatly on the side of the gun, which is pretty cool. In order to open it up, you have a little button here. You can lock the legs in position right there, and then the bipod is actually just threaded onto the front of the receiver tube here, and you can pivot it down. When it gets to the proper vertical position, there is a little locking catch right here that snaps into position. So I pull that out and I can rotate the bipod until it's vertical again. I also want to mention the muzzle device here. Um, we have the whole muzzle device assembly, which will come off for disassembly, but then we have the brake just by itself. It is a very simple it's just a single chamber brake there, and it's threaded on, you can see the threaded muzzle down there, and held in place by just a tightening clamp. So if I untighten that just a little bit, I can then unscrew the actual muzzle brake. And what's interesting about this is the gun uses, uh, uses energy from the muzzle brake pushing backwards to accelerate the barrel backwards to cycle properly. And so the manual actually talks about how uh, you can uh, effectively you can tune the muzzle brake for whatever specific load of ammunition you're shooting. And um, essentially the farther back you have it, the more energy you're going to be uh, generating, the more you're going to reduce recoil and put energy into the barrel. And so for uh, a particularly hot or heavy bullet load, you want it screwed all the way in like this, and for lighter ammunition you can unscrew it, and what they say is unscrew it to the point that you get potentially a malfunction, which would be the gun short stroking, uh, and then you screw the muzzle brake back down until the gun cycles properly. And uh, by doing that you will get the best balance of uh, reliability and recoil reduction. Disassembly is actually fairly simple. It begins with the bolt recoil spring, or return spring, right here on the back of the gun. We're going to push that in and lift it out through its little port there, and then the whole thing comes out. That's quite a lot of recoil spring there, so we'll set that aside. Next we're going to go to this screw on the back of the shoulder rest. It's got a, a spring-loaded detent, so it'll be a little snappy and stiff at first, but then just unscrew this the rest of the way. Once you've got it all the way out, it's captive and it'll float there. And then you can pivot the fire control group down. Now we're actually going to take this whole fire control group off. Now to do that, uh, we need to take out this pin right here. It comes up and out. Uh, and in order to allow it out we have to rotate this little washer so that that curved section allows the pin out. Now I can just tap that out from the other side, and that is our fire control assembly. Taking a closer look in here, this is hammer fired, so there's our, our hammer spring which is really quite substantial. When I pull the trigger, there's the hammer. It swings out of the side, which is interesting. Uh, it also means we've got the whole mechanism essentially up in here, so you don't have, well, <laughs> ironically, you still do have a pretty spongy, crummy trigger by like bullpups often do, although you'd think you wouldn't have to. Now we also have a semi-auto disconnector here, 
So once the bolt trips that in moving, it allows, well, it forces the hammer to recock, and you have to pull the trigger a second time for a second shot. This is really not a gun that you want to go full auto on you. We do also have a, a rather heavy duty recoil pad back here. Now we can get into the mechanical meat and potatoes. Uh, we're first going to pull the bolt out. Its recoil spring is already gone, so it'll just slide out the back of the action. I do want to point out here though that we have this continuous rib which acts to hold the top cartridge in the magazine down until the, the bolt, the barrel is forward and the bolt is in position to pick up a new cartridge. Um, and that's important to prevent pressure from the magazine from having an adverse impact uh, on the cycling. And it also prevents the cartridges from coming up and potentially having feeding problems. I also, while we're here, want to point out that we have this secondary track, uh, cam track, on the inside of the receiver. That essentially matches the cam track on the, the lower assembly. So this is going to push this roller up, while this track is pushing the roller behind, which you haven't seen yet, down to ensure that there's an even force exerted on the bolt to unlock it nice and smoothly. So we'll rotate this up to unlock, and then that just comes right out. It's got a track right here that runs on this set of rails on the top of the receiver. Now to take the barrel out we first have to unscrew the entire muzzle assembly. That's left hand thread. So it doesn't really have to be tight because it's, uh, it's going to tighten itself with every shot. Once that's off, then I have this cap, which is what's retaining the recoil spring for the barrel. Being a long recoil gun, there is one spring for the barrel and a separate spring for the bolt, since they have to act interchangeably, or uh, independently. So this I'm going to push in, rotate like 90 degrees, there it is. and then that cap comes off, and we have another really huge recoil spring. There, so that's what's pushing the barrel forward and holding the barrel back when you're firing. And with that all gone, I can just slide the barrel out the back of the gun. It's got this nice little fluted section in the middle, very finely made. Um, this is a really uh, carefully made bearing surface. And what's kind of cool is there's actually a brass ring in there that the barrel is uh, sliding on. So it's like a, a friction ring. Uh, so that bearing surface is what's going to uh, prevent the barrel from sticking. It's, uh, it's going to be softer than steel, so it will... that's probably a wear part over time, but it's a really cool addition to the, the design that you don't see very often. Um, you can actually even see the little square lug there. I'm sure there's a special wrench you can get in there and unscrew it and replace it. And there's one down here as well uh, for the extension bar of the bolt. So the bolt has six locking lugs, uh, really rather AR-like. We've got our extractor, we've got a plunger ejector in there, and at the moment the bolt is actually locked in, well ironically, locked in the unlocked position. So when uh, this is, is rotated up to open, this little cam, this little lever, locks the bolt in place. And if I push that down, the bolt rotates into the locked position. And so what happens when this is cycling is, once the bolt is locked, it goes into the locking lugs here, that gets tripped. It lifts up like so, and there's a really big coil spring inside this bolt carrier that forces the bolt head itself to rotate into the locked position. And that spring is always in there trying to force the bolt to be locked, which is a nice safety element. So when these are cycling, of course, the bolt is locked into the barrel, and at the end of travel those two cam tracks force these two roller bearings to rotate the whole bolt head up like that. It will rotate up into the locked position, at which point the barrel is now free. There's nothing that holds the barrel back. As soon as it's unlocked from the bolt, the barrel goes shooting forward, and the uh, the bolt and carrier here are held open by this catch, which locks up on the front of the receiver. As soon as the barrel goes all the way forward, it, it trips this down, which releases 
the bolt carrier to go forward, pick up a cartridge, lock into the barrel, and start the process all over again. Now our final bit of disassembly, I'm going to pull the bolt out. Uh, what we need to do is unscrew this conical cap, and it's held in place by that spring detent. So, I'll be a little careful with this. There we go, so that comes out. And then we have our firing pin, firing pin spring. I should point out that this, among a number of other elements in the gun, are under almost constant iterative improvement. So um, this is an improvement from a previous method that had a little wire clip spring holding this part in place. Um, even just some little things, like the contour of the bolt recoil spring. This has been improved even over this current owner's uh, not very long ownership of the gun. Uh, he actually managed to damage his original recoil spring, and the replacement they sent him had a different configuration here that was uh, easier to get securely locked into the receiver. So good on Gepard for recognizing that there are incremental improvements to be made, and actually making them. Anyway, now that we've got the firing pin out, we can take this block. You know, this block is very tightly fitted on. So that's your two roller lugs. And then... There we go. There is the bolt itself. There's the bolt locking spring that I was talking about. It hooks onto that little projection right there. And there you go. Everything about this gun is really nicely machined. It's very impressive uh, on the interior. Uh, just finely made parts fit smoothly and tightly together. It's that sort of tight fit of proper clearances and proper manufacturing tolerances. Not just that you have to hammer it together, but it's too really perfectly machined surfaces that are meant to be tight, and that's that's the feel that you get from this. Well there you go, there is the Gepard M6, all field stripped out for you. The M6 is actually used by a couple of militaries these days. Not a whole lot. Uh, it is used by Hungary as well as a few others, but there are really a surprising number of 50 caliber anti-material rifles out there for militaries that are looking for them. And it's a fairly specialized sort of niche type of firearm. Uh, you've got, of course, a number of different varieties of Barrett 50 caliber rifles. You've got Zastava's M93. Uh, you've got uh, PGM's Eket 2, and a number of others out there. So I am really quite curious to see how this compares in actual firing handling. Uh, I will tuck it up and shoot it right-handed, because I'm not putting my face over this thing when the gun cycles. But we're going to take this out to the range tomorrow and see what it's like to actually shoot it. So stick around for that. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.